The series begins in a totally rad spring in 1990. At that time, there were these two buddies, Eikichi and Ryuji. They were like superstars at Shonen High School. Everyone loved them. They even had a cool nickname, Onibaku. And you know what made them so famous? Their incredible teamwork and fighting skills. They were like the ultimate champions, always leading Shonen High to victory against other schools. So there they were, chilling on the beach, checking out all the cute girls playing volleyball. It was just another awesome day in their epic saga. One day, Eikichi and Ryuji were feeling pretty darn bored with their everyday lives. It was like they were stuck in a never-ending cycle of brawls, fights, and more brawls. But little did everyone know, behind all the beautiful scenery, there was a fierce rivalry going on between Sean and Hai and a wild motorcycle gang from another school. At that time, Eikichi and Ryuji couldn't care less about their schoolmates' pleas for help in the fight. All they wanted was to have a blast, playing around with the gorgeous girls on the beach. But hold your horses, because that dream quickly turned into a nightmare. Suddenly, the girls got scared because they think Eikichi and Ryuji were troublemakers. And guess who showed up to the rescue? The Coast Guard. Turns out he is a Yakuza member, and he wasn't too happy with our boys. Then, with no other choice, Eikichi and Ryuji reluctantly joined forces with their fellow Shonen High buddies in an epic fistfight. But because Eikichi and Ryuji got so fed up with the endless fights, motorcycle madness, and all the chaos, they decided to play a little prank. At that time, they made up a fake confession, spreading the word that they were expelled from Shonen High. Hearing that, the whole school was buzzing with disbelief. Soon after, Eikichi and Ryuji left their comrades with an important message. They said, hey, it's your turn now. This is your era. Finally, they had a chance to break free from their delinquent lives and chase after their dreams. They'd wanted the simple joys of playing with girls, having a girlfriend, and living a peaceful life. Then, they scoffed at their old comrades who dreamed of becoming Yakuza because, let's be real, that was just an empty dream. They didn't want to be looked down upon by society anymore. It was time for a fresh start, a quest for love and a better life. But wait, there's a sassy salon keeper who tries to bring Eikichi and Ryuji down. She mocks them and says they won't succeed with their ugly personalities. Just delinquents, she says, you'll be single for life. Well, guess what? They won't let her reign on their parade. Soon after, Eikichi and Ryuji stumble upon a magazine featuring an island resort. They imagine all the bachelorette parties and lovely ladies there. Oh boy, that sounds like the perfect vacation spot. At that time, excitement fills their hearts as they head over. Soon after, Eikichi and Ryuji arrive at the resort and see the girls frolicking in the pool. Their spirits soar, especially when one of the girls even greets them and asks for a drink. But, oh no, it turns out to be yet another empty dream. They fail once again. Bummer. However, amidst their disappointment, Eikichi and Ryuji spot two incredibly cute girls who catch their attention. The mood is just right until a group of rowdy men disrupt the scene, messing up the pool and ruining the vibe. Then, they decide it's time to make a swift exit. Adios, pool party. Shortly after, Eikichi and Ryuji venture into a nightclub. There, they try to scope out the situation and suddenly, the same two cute girls from the pool pass right in front of them. But hold up, there's trouble ahead. Suddenly, a group of delinquents from Osaka starts harassing the girls, trying to force them to play along. But these two ladies are strong and independent, they refuse to give in. Then, out of nowhere, Eikichi and Ryuji became the ultimate heroes, catching the attention of those two women they were trying to protect. At that time, Eikichi, with all his bravery, suggested settling things outside. Oh boy, they had really caught the eye of these guys. But our dynamic duo wasn't phased at all. They had the confidence to take down these seemingly weak opponents. Little did those delinquents know, they were messing with the famous Onibaku Du. At that moment, the two girls were worried sick about Eikichi and Ryuji, who were coming to their rescue. But guess what? Those delinquents got a taste of their own medicine and ended up sprawled on the floor outside. Knowing that the girls were overjoyed and wasted no time taking Eikichi and Ryuji to the hotel to treat their wounds, 
And guess what else? The leader of the delinquents found Akichi's dropped ID card. Shortly after, with only minor injuries, our brave guys were finally taken care of by the two girls at the hotel. They received proper treatment and care, thanks to their newfound heroism. And turns out, the girls' name were Ayumi and Moriko. They were over the moon and super grateful that Akichi and Ryuji had turned their backs on their thuggish ways. Soon after, Ayumi and Moriko spilled the beans and confessed they were actually Tokyo schoolgirls. And guess what? The two guys spilled their own secret, too, that they were medical students from Tokyo. Shortly after, Akichi, feeling all confident, whipped out his magical rubber and shared it with Ryuji. Yep, you heard that right, a magic rubber. What does it do? Who knows? But it got them both buzzing with excitement and their hearts pounding like crazy. On the other hand, Ayumi and Mariko had a master plan in motion. Mariko would take Akichi to the swimming pool, while Ayumi would have some alone time with Ryuji in the room. Oh boy, they couldn't let this opportunity slip away. At that time, Akichi and Ryuji, being the smart cookies they are, had prepared themselves for this momentous night by chowing down on lots of bad breath deodorant. Yep, you heard that right too. They wanted to make sure their breath stayed fresh and minty for the long haul. However, little did they know, consuming that kind of stuff wasn't the best idea for our Onibaku do. Soon after, Ryuji and Ayumi found themselves alone together, and Ryuji decides to put on his cool act. He stops Ayumi and says, Hold up. Before we get into anything, let's get to know each other better. And just like that, he excuses himself from the room. Why, you ask? Well, turns out Ryuji had a bit of a stomach ache from munching on that bad breath medicine earlier. Ouch. But hey, the fun times were just around the corner, and Ryuji's stomach couldn't take any chances. Here comes the crazy part that both Ryuji and Eikichi end up in the same predicament. They meet up in the lobby and start blaming each other, desperately screaming for that one toilet they could find. In the end, poor Ryuji has no choice but to give Eikichi a good beating and apologize. Meanwhile, Ayumi and Mariko are looking pretty sad. They start thinking, are we so unappealing that these two medical students left us hanging? We didn't even get a chance to exchange addresses. The next day, our beloved Onibaku duo decides to enroll as new students at Sujito High School. And guess who they stumble upon? Ayumi and Moriko. Yeah, those same girls from before. But here's the kicker, they're not just any girls, they're actually teachers at this school. After knowing that, the four of them are in total shock, accusing each other of playing tricks and cheating. But wait, there's more. A gang of troublemakers, who found Eikichi's ID, storms into Sujido High School. The students are petrified. The leader of these troublemakers, Okuno, is shouting in anger, blaming our heroes for stirring up trouble. He declares that the Onibaku do is done for. Oh boy, the other students are scared out of their wits, fearing they'll be attacked by these thugs. But hold your breath, folks, because Eikichi and Ryuji aren't backing down that easily. They step up to the challenge, ready to settle the score. Now you might think this bunch of delinquents would be easy to defeat, right? Well, you're wrong. These two are the Onibaku, and they don't back down from any fight. They give it their all, and it's quite a spectacle. However, little did they know, this fight would expose their true identities as legendary champions. Suddenly, word spreads like wildfire among all the students at Sujido High School, and fear fills the air. The name Onibaku is synonymous with being tough and ruthless. The disappointment was real for Eikichi and Ryuji. They had gone out of their way to help the students, but alas, the two young teachers were not expecting the famous Onibaku duo to transfer to their school. Bummer, right? But hey, Ayumi and Mariko were there to patch up their wounds and make sure that the Onibaku duo wouldn't get kicked out of Sujido High School. Now let me tell you something about these two teachers. They were truly dedicated, even though our heroes were a bit on the delinquent side. Ayumi and Mariko believed that deep down, these two troublemakers had the potential to change. They weren't about to abandon their students, no sir. Hearing that, our heroes were deeply moved by the unwavering dedication of these two female teachers. To make matters even more interesting, 
Ayumi took it upon herself to introduce Ardu to the class. And guess what? The class was filled with mischievous troublemakers from the naughtiest and laziest bunch at Sujido High School, but Eikichi and Ryuji, being the smooth talkers they are, put on friendly smiles and tried to win everyone over. Soon after, when Eikichi and Ryuji were minding their own business, two students named Makoto and Sukai approached them with a cocky attitude. But surprise, surprise. These two guys turned out to be their fans. They looked up to the mighty Onibaku duo with great respect. Well, however, Ryuji wasn't having any of it. He immediately shut them down, telling them they've left their thuggish ways behind. Hearing that, Makoto and Sukai were disappointed and tried their best to win them over. But wait, there's more. Here comes Ido, a girl who decided to join in on the wooing action. She thought she could charm Eikichi and Ryuji, but alas, she was quickly driven away. But suddenly, Makoto has an intriguing offer for Eikichi and Ryuji. He tells them about Alice's school festival, happening next week. It's this fancy high-class girls' high school, where the girls are not only beautiful, but also super rich. And guess what? Without an invitation, no one can enter. Then, Makoto pulls out a ticket like magic. Seeing that, Eikichi and Ryuji are immediately drawn in. They start dreaming about creating their very own Onibaku clan within the school. Forget everything else, entering the festival and meeting beautiful girls is the top priority for them. On the other hand, Ayumi and Mariko receive some news from the principal that a new guidance counselor named Minamino Yoko is joining the school. So, Minami is known to be super strict and disciplined. Ayumi and Mariko respect him a lot and sing his praises. Meanwhile, in a cozy little cafe, there are two guys who love to hang out. This place is a hot spot for delinquent students who skip school, and who shows up. Kamada and Saadijima, two famous delinquents who are known as the mad dogs in their area. Coincidentally, they used to be students at Shonen High School, and they start chatting about the amazing duo of their former leader, who's now at Sujito High School. Shortly after, Kamada and Saijima starts laughing and teasing, which gets the Shonen High students all riled up. Suddenly, a fights break out. However, these two are tough cookies, and unfortunately, the Shonen disciples stand no chance against them. Then, just to add to their arrogance, Kamada and Saijima boldly declares, Onibaku are no match for us. And after saying that, they go. Sometime later, Finally, the day everyone had been waiting for had arrived. It was the legendary Alice's school festival. At that time, everyone was beyond excited as they stepped foot into school. Oh boy, the gate alone was packed with beautiful girls. They couldn't contain their excitement and eagerly made their way inside to soak in the festival vibes. On the other hand, Sukai, being the sneaky one, whispered a rumor that the girls would give their hearts to the person they liked during the festival. Well, you can only imagine the excitement building up within the Onibaku duo. Love was in the air. At that time, people were going crazy over tickets for the matchmaking events happening on stage. And let me tell you, those ticket prices were sky high. But fear not, our quick-thinking Makoto pulled out his magic tickets for Eikichi and Ryuji. Then, the matchmaking event began. Now, here's where things get interesting. Both Eikichi and Ryuji set their sights on the same girl, a certain Aina. Soon after, Ryuji, brimming with confidence, approached her with style. But wait, Eikichi wasn't one to back down either. He approached Aina with equal confidence. And guess what? Aina chose Eikichi. Uh oh, Ryuji's heart took a little tumble there, and he quickly made his exit from the scene. The next day, Eikichi can't help but proudly show off that he scored himself a girlfriend at the Alice's school festival. Oh boy, you can imagine Ryuji feeling all gloomy and grumpy, swearing up a storm at Eikichi. Poor guy, feeling left out. To add insult to injury, Eikichi proudly declares that he's going to skip class this afternoon because he has a date with Aina. Hearing that, Ryuji's emotions are running wild, and he's cursing like there's no tomorrow. In his borrowed car, Eikichi picks up Aina, all ready for their afternoon date. But hold up, there's a surprise waiting for them. They're intercepted by the new teacher, the one and only Minami, 
This new teacher doesn't care about appearances. He catches Akichi red-handed, skipping school, and throws him right back into the classroom. And just like that, Minami introduces himself as Minamino Yoko, shattering the dreams of all the students. This person is like a dictator, leading the class with absolute authority. The next day, after Akichi's first date didn't go as planned, he thought he'd give it another shot. At that time, he decides to pay a visit to Aina's house. And guess what? It's like fate was playing its cards because Aina's house is quiet and her parents aren't around. Perfect timing, right? Akichi, being the quirky guy he is, takes out his magic rubber once again. Yep, that trusty rubber makes an appearance. So, the two of them settle down in the living room. They're all cozy, and the atmosphere feels just right. But hold on to your hats, because things are about to take a surprising turn. As the romantic song plays softly in the background, creating an ambience of serenity, suddenly, a baby's cry interrupts the moment. Uh-oh. Turns out, Aina already has a child. Yep, she became a mom last year. Knowing that, Akichi is in complete shock and immediately considers making a swift exit. But wait, just as he's about to leave, Aina's parents come home at the worst possible time. At that time, Aina, being quick on her feet, introduces Akichi as the potential new daddy for her child. However, Akichi wants no part in this unexpected fatherhood business. He rejects the proposal and makes a run for it, leaving Aina's parents fuming with anger. Meanwhile, the following day, the male students are all gathered in the counseling room, and guess who's in charge? It's the notorious Minami, checking everyone's hair and bags like a detective on a mission. And let me tell you, he's taking it to the extreme. At that time, one poor soul gets caught red-handed with adult magazines, and he faced some harsh punishment. Meanwhile, Ayumi and Mariko are making their way towards the counseling room witnessing Minami's exaggerated actions firsthand. And at the same time, Chukai gets caught with a photo of Ito and receives a hard slap. Seeing that, Akichi reaches his boiling point. He can't take it anymore. He demands that the teacher apologize, but guess what? Minami has a ridiculous response that he asks them to show up the next day with bald heads. But wait, our Onibakudu isn't about to back down. They stand up to this tyrannical teacher and give him a taste of their own slam down. Then, just when things couldn't get any crazier, the principal storms in, anger radiating from every pore. He threatens to immediately expel Akichi and Ryuji. But suddenly, the other students come to their defense. At that time, Ayumi, Mariko, and even the rest of the gang stand up for them. They point out that it was Minami who went way too far. They plead with the principal not to kick Akichi and Ryuji out. And guess what? Ayumi and Mariko even threaten to resign if the principal goes through with the expulsion. Hearing that, the principal cancels the expulsion. Meanwhile, the next day, Sukai and Ido were having a chat at the cafe, minding their own business. Little did they know, some thugs from Shonen students who got beat up yesterday were sitting nearby. Out of nowhere, these thugs start scolding Sukai for joking around with Ido. At that time, Sukai, being all confident and thinking he's a tough cookie, wants to show off to Ido. But here's the thing, they're outnumbered. Yep, a whole bunch of people. Sukai finds himself in a sticky situation and ends up getting a beating. Suddenly, one of the students screams for help, calling out to the mighty Onibaku duo. They come to the rescue. Sukai, all beaten up, find solace in the fact that he and Ido are friends of the legendary Onibaku. And guess what? Those thugs immediately stop their nonsense, apologize, and even pay for the medical expenses. Why? Because they're scared witless of the infamous Onibaku name. But hold on a minute, the drama doesn't end there. Kamada and Saejima make their grand entrance. They've heard that Sukai is a friend of the Onibaku duo, but guess what? The Onibaku duo arrived late. Poor Tsukai has been beaten to a pulp. Ido can't help but scold the Onibaku duo for their tardiness. Meanwhile, our observant Makoto realizes that someone is specifically targeting the Onibaku. It seems like these two mad dogs from Kyukin are behind it all. He knew it because there are some sign they left in the parking lot. 
The next day, Eikichi is having this wild dream where he's a teacher, strutting into class with a big smile on his face. But hold up, his dream takes a turn for the unexpected. Instead of a warm welcome, he gets bullied by his own students. Why you ask? Well, apparently it's because they found out he's a virgin. Yep, you heard it right. Eikichi's dream turns into a nightmare, and it's just too much for him to handle. He wakes up with a scream that could wake up the whole neighborhood. And here come Makoto, Sukai, and Ido, witnessing Eikichi's dream-induced outburst. You can't blame them for bursting into laughter. I mean, who dreams during the day, right? Eikichi is the star of the show, providing some good entertainment with his dreamy escapades. On the other hand, Ryuji was having a chat with Ayumi. At that time, Ryuji is feeling mighty grateful for Ayumi's help from the other day. They seem to have a familiar bond, you know. But here's the funny part. Ayumi seems a bit uneasy talking to Ryuji. And to add to the fun, Ayumi gives Ryuji an assignment. She wants him to score at least 80. Ryuji, being the confident guy he is, tells her that he'll nail it and even asks for a reward. Well, 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 that gets Ayumi all flustered and shy. But hold up, here comes Eikichi, trying to get in on the action. He's peeking at the scene, looking all annoyed. Oh boy, Eikichi, what's the matter? Maybe he's just jealous or feeling left out, who knows? Meanwhile, Makoto is strolling down the school hallway, minding his own business, when suddenly, he's approached by two students. These troublemakers demand that Makoto give them two buns from the canteen. But hey, Makoto is no pushover. He's feeling all buddy-buddy with the onibaku do, so he flat-out rejects their request. But hold your horses, because these two troublemakers aren't happy with Makoto's response. They start threatening him, saying that if the school hotshots, Sadijima and Kamada, who were on leave, come back, Makoto will face the consequences. Yikes. Despite the threats, our brave Makoto stands his ground and continues to refuse. But turns out, Sadijima and Kamada are actually students from Sujito's school. The next day, they are off the hook and back in school and boy, they have a bone to pick with Makoto. At that time, they think Makoto's friendship with the Onibaku crew making him arrogant and full of himself. So, Sadijima decides to give Makoto a task, warning him to watch out if he refuses. Meanwhile, Eikichi, Sukai, and Ido are all chilling at a cozy cafe, having good old chat. But wait, here comes Makoto, and boy, does he look gloomy. At that time, Eikichi notices Makoto's mood and invites him to join their group. However, Tsukai and Ido, being the caring friends they are, can't help but worry about the Onibaku duo. They've noticed that things seem a bit distant and not as fun lately, especially with Saijima and Kamana causing a ruckus. Soon after school, Makoto decides to join Eikichi on a sneaky mission to spy on Ryuji and Ayumi at the bowling alley. Ooh, they look so happy together. But wait, Eikichi sees Ryuji alone, and he's furious. He thinks Ryuji has ditched Ayumi, leaving her heartbroken. Oh no. Little did Eikichi know, things are not as they seem. Turns out, Ryuji's got a different goal in mind. He wants to experience dating and, well, let go of his virgin status. On the other hand, Ayumi, being the bold girl she is, comes out of the bathroom and reveals that she's willing to give herself to Ryuji because she likes him too. But here's the catch, Ayumi has a request. She wants Ryuji to be serious about their relationship, quit the Onibaku life, and marry her quickly so they can start a family. Whoa, well, talk about taking things to the next level. Ryuji, caught off guard, starts to panic. He hadn't really thought that far ahead. Ayumi's request is more serious than he expected. She wants him to let go of the Onibaku lifestyle and commit to a future together. Meanwhile, poor Eikichi, who's been following this whole drama, is feeling desperate. He catches sight of Ryuji and Ayumi in a hotel and fears that the Onibaku crew is on the verge of disbanding. Soon after, Makoto tries to convince Eikichi to leave the place they're in. Makoto mentions meeting his girlfriend and another girl. Then he suggests Eikichi to follow him to have some fun with the girls. Hearing that, Eikichi's ears perk up with excitement. He's curious to see what's up. 
Shortly after, Makoto takes Eikichi to a certain spot, but guess what? It was all a trap. Sneaky saw Ejima and Kamada were waiting there, ready to attack poor Eikichi. Turns out, these troublemakers were the ones who threatened Makoto into bringing Eikichi to that place. At that time, Eikichi never expected Makoto to betray him like this. Feeling guilty, Makoto immediately apologizes, realizing the grave mistake he's made. Soon after, Saejima and Kamada start beating up Eikichi, who's defenseless at this point. It's a real downer, and Makoto feels incredibly guilty for the situation. Sadly, even when Eikichi and Makoto put up a fight, they're outnumbered by these low-down thugs. At that moment, Eikichi can't help but scoff at them, mocking their dirty tactics and how they can only rely on ganging up on him. Then, as a result of the brutal beating, Eikichi's hand ends up injured. Meanwhile, the next day at school, Ayumi, the teacher, is in for a surprise when she realizes that Ryuji, Eikichi, and Makoto are nowhere to be found in class. On the other hand, Sadijima and Kamada are causing even more trouble around school. They've become so mean that they don't hesitate to beat up any student who dares to stand up against them. No fair play for them, victory is all that matters, no matter what it takes. Poor Makoto gets dragged into their shenanigans again and again. Meanwhile, Sukai and Ido can't stand seeing Ryuji so lost in his thoughts about the future. They scold him for being so distant and careless about the troubles their school is facing because of two fearsome dudes named Sadajima and Kamada. But guess what? Ryuji still doesn't seem to care. Oh boy, what a mess. But hold on tight, because things take a sudden twist. When Ryuji hears the news about Eikichi's condition, he rushes to the hospital in a total panic. He's furious to see Eikichi all beaten up and wants to know what happened. However, Eikichi is already mad at Ryuji. He's done with the Onibaku and doesn't care about it anymore. He said it's better for Ryuji to go back to pursuing Ayumi and continuing his courtship with her. Then he said he doesn't see Ryuji as a friend anymore. After hearing that, Ryuji leaves feeling disappointed. The next day, Ryuji, dressed up as an Onibaku badass, heads to the meeting spot where Saijima and Kamada's gang usually hangs out. But oh no, they're not there, just their lackeys. So Ryuji decides to give them a taste of their own medicine and beats them up real good. Ouch, those poor fellas end up needing an ambulance to take them away. Meanwhile, Ayumi visits the hospital to check on Eikichi. Little does she know, Eikichi is actually thinking a lot about Ryuji. There, he tells Ayumi that Ryuji has strong feelings for her and asks her to guide him. Eikichi doesn't mind if the Onibaku disband as long as Ryuji is happy, but Ayumi denies it. Ayumi said Ryuji isn't planning to leave Eikichi behind. Nope, not at all. He never intended to quit being part of the Onibaku. At that time, Ayumi had asked Ryuji to choose her and stop all the fighting to leave the Onibaku behind. But he refuses. He said Eikichi is the most precious friend he has in this whole wide world. He just can't leave Eikichi behind, and he apologizes to Ayumi for the confusion. After hearing all the explanation, Eikichi realizes what's really going on. On the other hand, Ryuji shows up at Saadijima and Kamada's hideout, and boy, were they in for a surprise. Their goons tried to block Ryuji, but they ended up looking like a bunch of beaten up potatoes. Finally, the leaders themselves came out, and their lackeys thought they had it all figured out. But guess what? Ryuji stood up and said that Eikichi is even stronger than him. These guys can only resort to playing dirty. Feeling all tough and proud, they decided to gang up on Ryuji. And suddenly, Eikichi in his mighty Onibaku outfit showed up. And when these two joined forces, there's no stopping them. Saejima and Kamada didn't stand a chance. They got a good beating and their goons quickly ran away, leaving their boss behind. Suddenly, Kamada tried to be sneaky with a knife, but Makoto stepped in and gave him a good whack. Soon after, Tsukai and Ido arrived just in time to see Makoto being blamed for betraying them. But Eikichi set the record straight that Makoto never left their side, and hearing that touched Makoto's heart. Then, Tsukai and Ido praised Eikichi 
for being such a loyal friend. The following day, the Onibaku duo are chilling at a cafe, enjoying their food. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Makoto shows up. And guess what he's up to? He's proudly showing off his collection of photos of cute girls from the first grade. Yep, Makoto is the go-to guy when it comes to knowing who the cutest first graders are. On the other hand, Akichi, always up for some mischief, points at one of the girls in the photo, not realizing it's actually Makoto's ex-girlfriend. Oh boy, that really ticked Makoto off. Right next to them, there's a young couple having a serious moment. The girl is crying her heart out because something was decided all of a sudden. She's begging the boy, but he remains cool as a cucumber and refuses. Talk about playing with people's emotions, right? These playboys really know how to mess with other people's feelings. The next day, at school, a Yumi steps up to the front of the class and introduces a new student. And guess who it is? It's Abe Hiroshi, the legendary womanizer who drove the Onibaku do crazy just by his presence. At that time, Ayumi points to an empty seat at the back for him to sit, but Abe chooses Ryuji's seat instead. Ryuji is fuming with anger and refuses to move. He's getting all worked up about it. However, Ayumi gives him an annoyed look because she doesn't want any drama in her class. She gives Ryuji a signal to move, and reluctantly, he gives in and moves while grumbling. During recess, Abe shows off his skills in charming the ladies. Not a single girl can resist his advances. The female students immediately flock to him, hanging on to his every word, but his cocky attitude rubs the male students the wrong way, especially Ryuji, who sees him as an enemy of the Onibaku. Soon after, Ryuji orders Eikichi to teach Abe a lesson. Then, Eikichi approaches Abe, but to everyone's surprise, he asks to be friends with him. He wants to learn from him. Abe's confidence really impresses Eikichi. He openly admits that he wants to be popular like Abe and asks for his help in meeting girls. On the other hand, Ryuji, annoyed with Abe's arrogance, challenges him. But Abe tells Ryuji to be nice and offers to teach him how to be popular too. The prospect of attracting more girls changes Ryuji's mind and he immediately starts respecting Abe. In the end, the Onibaku duo willingly becomes his followers. On their day off, they decide to have a refreshing swim. Makoto, Sukai, and Ido join in on the fun. Today, the Onibaku duo will have private lessons with Abe. Soon after, Abe walks up to them and starts giving three tips on how to attract women. The first tip is to show irresistible charm that makes them weak at the knees. And the second tip is all about having the perfect fringe because it can be quite mesmerizing for women. Abe then decides to demonstrate his techniques. He confidently flirts with four girls at once. These girls are actually up and coming TV stars, which surprises the Onibaku duo. Shortly after, he starts displaying his elegant charm, wooing the girls and even inviting them for a meal at a fancy restaurant. The girls are completely captivated by his seduction. At that time, Ryuji and Eikichi are left in awe of Abe's skills. Meanwhile, in the parking lot, the girls are totally impressed by Abe's modified car and invite them for a ride. Soon after, the Onibaku do eagerly asks Abe about the final tip. Abe tells them to meet at 5 a.m. and then leaves with the girls. But guess what? While they're at the parking lot, they run into their old enemies, Sadijima and Kamada. Surprisingly, neither of them holds a grudge against the Onibaku do. They apologize and hope to let bygones be bygones. Turns out, all four of them share a common problem, that they don't have girlfriend and are single. Sanijima tries to strike up a conversation with one of the girls who wants to go swimming, but unfortunately, he's mistaken for a Yakuza. Oops. Soon after, Eikichi proudly presents the outcome of their training with Abe. He approaches two girls waiting in line and puts into action the tips he learned. One of them, Kaoru, is completely captivated by Eikichi's flirting, and they become friends. There, Eikichi proudly admits to his companions that the people behind him are not his friends. Then, Ryuji eagerly asks if Eikichi managed to get the phone number of the girl from the pool yesterday. The Onibaku do anxiously awaits Abe, as promised. Then, from a distance, someone was seen energetically delivering newspapers from house to house. 
Surprisingly, it was none other than Ava himself. It turns out that the final tip he shared is about the importance of money, because let's face it, everything requires money, and women are fascinated by men who work hard and are persistent in earning it. Ryuji, on the other hand, is busy fixing a motorcycle at the workshop of his senior, Masami. While working, he ponders about the amount of capital he would need to open his own workshop, as he recalls his promise to Ayumi. Meanwhile, at the headquarters of a motorcycle gang, a group of thugs is enjoying a game of billiards. Suddenly, another group arrives, deliberately causing a commotion, and more members of their motorcycle gang follow suit. These individuals are affiliated with Saejima, the mad dog from Kamakura. However, their leader, a guy named Fumiya, has come seeking Saejima and Kamada. The next day, Ryuji brought Am for a morning ride, along for a chat. At that time, he made a heartfelt confession, promising that after graduating high school, he would open a workshop and live a blissful life with Ayumi. Little did they know, they were being followed by the boss of a motorcycle gang named Fumiya. As they stood on a bridge, Ayumi gazed into the distance, feeling a sense of unease. It seemed that the bridge held unpleasant memories for her. She began to apologize, explaining that she couldn't fully commit to Ryuji. It seemed she had a past with the motorcycle enthusiast, but before Ayumi could finish her story, Fumiya abruptly appeared, warning Ryuji not to be deceived by Ayumi's charms. Without wasting a moment, Fumiya revved up his motorcycle and sped away. The gang he led began to intimidate and harass the students, demanding daily deposits from them in their own territory. On the other hand, Sukai and Abi were heading home when they stumbled upon the notorious motorcycle gang causing trouble in their neighborhood. Soon after, a brawl erupted, and Sukai and Abe fought back with all their might. However, these gang members resorted to dirty tactics like using tear spray, overpowering Abe and Sukai in the process. Turns out, their next target was Sanijima, but little did they know that they were messing with the wrong person. At that time, Saijima put up a strong fight, defending himself against their attacks. Unfortunately, these cowards resorted to cheating, and Saijima was ultimately defeated. The following day, Ryuji was excitedly sharing his plans with Eikichi about opening a workshop after graduating from high school. He was determined to pursue a serious relationship with Ayumi. Hearing that, Eikichi was thrilled for his friend's dreams, and also mentioned his own love interest to Kaoru. However, their conversation took a sudden turn when Makoto arrived with distressing news. Their friends had been attacked, leaving Ryuji and Eikichi deeply concerned. Turns out, Fumiya's motorcycle gang had taken over the area where Saijima's friends usually gathered. After knowing that Saijima and Kamada couldn't let this slide, so they decided to confront them and seek revenge for what happened before. Then, they called upon their other friends to join forces. Soon after, a chaotic brawl erupted with wrestling and skirmishes. Saejima and Kamada found themselves outnumbered, facing off against a large group. Those sneaky gang members resorted to cheating tactics, and their leader Funia joined in the fight. It was a daunting situation with all their motorbike buddies surrounding Saejima and Kamada. In the midst of the chaos, Kamada ended up getting hurt, leaving Saejima in a state of panic as he saw his injured friend. Soon after, Ryuji's crew arrived, recognizing the motorbike guy on the bridge. They couldn't catch up with him because they had to take care of Kamada and immediately called an ambulance. At that time, Eikichi was curious about Ayumi's previous connection with the motorcycle gang boss. On the other hand, Kamada received medical treatment and underwent surgery while his friends anxiously waited outside. Suddenly, a middle-aged woman and a young girl showed up. It turns out Kamada is Kaoru's older brother, the person Eikichi has a crush on. Not long after, Ayumi and Noriko also arrived. Then, two policemen came to investigate the incident. At that moment, Detective Yuda mocked the Onibaku for still being troublemakers. The detective asked who stabbed Kamada, but the Onibaku do refused to answer, deciding to handle the situation themselves. However, Ayumi, who was curious, chased after Ryuji. Ryuji also questioned the man on the bridge. Sadly, she couldn't provide an answer. Suddenly, 
Fumia stormed into the hospital, causing a ruckus. Fortunately, the two cops intervened before another fight began. Before leaving, Fumia confidently stated that he would do something to Ayumi. Meanwhile, in a regular cafe, Ayumi finally reveals who Fumia really is. She confesses that Fumia is her former fiance's younger brother. Her fiance used to be a motorcyclist, and they had a great relationship. Fumia and his older brother, Naito, got along very well. However, there was an accident on the bridge. Ayumi survived, but Naito, her fiance, passed away. Fumia, who was close to his brother, became filled with rage. He blamed Ayumi for being the only one who survived. Turns out, he had been holding a grudge against her for a long time, unable to forget that incident. Soon after, Ryuji approached Ayumi. There, he said he wanted to move forward and start a new life. However, Fumia returned at that moment. Not long after, Makoto and Abi also arrived, and the situation at school was really bad. They targeted people who knew the Onibaku duo. Then, Kaoru also came looking for Eikichi to thank him for taking care of Kamada. The following day, Fumia's gang goes to Kaoru's school and kidnaps her. At the same time, Ayumi, who was placing flowers on the bridge, is also kidnapped by Fumia. These two girls are now locked up in a warehouse. Now Fumia is only focused on his revenge and wants to eliminate Ayumi and those close to her. He's blinded by his grudge and plans to lure Ryuji, Ayumi's lover and friend of the Onibaku. It all ends here, according to him. Not long after, Ido comes to the classroom and finds something thrown in front of the school. It belongs to Kaoru and Ayumi. There's a message on the paper indicating a location where they should go. Knowing that, the Onibaku do is furious and leaves the class with their motorcycles, wearing their proud Onibaku uniforms. They hit the road and head towards the designated location. Then, Ryuji declares that today he will teach them a lesson with his fists. People who dwell in the past can't move forward in life. Suddenly, two attackers try to crash into the Onibaku do but fail. Then, Fumia quickly runs away and Ryuji chases after him and only his crew remains now. Shortly after, Eikichi shouts that they are just losers who need to be taught a lesson. As Ryuji gets on his motorbike to chase Fumia, he cunningly attacks Ryuji's bike and they both fall from the bridge. At that moment, Fumia is thrilled that Ryuji fell, but the Onibaku can't be defeated so easily. Ryuji climbs back up the bridge and Fumia starts freaking out. He realizes he's no match for Ryuji and becomes the target of his powerful punches. However, Ryuji doesn't finish him off. He says that when a man loves someone, he'll do anything. Those were the same words his older brother, Naito, had once told him. However, Fumia was blinded by revenge and led astray by hatred. He was about to catch up to his brother, but Ryuji saves him. Instead of letting him die, Ryuji gives him advice that he must have the courage to live his life. Soon after, all of Fumia's gang members are caught, and the girls are saved. There, Kaoru immediately hugs Eikichi, who was scared. Eikichi confesses his feelings, but Kaoru shakes her head and says she can't accept it. She apologizes and leaves. At that time, Fumia must face the consequences of his actions and is arrested. Soon after, Ryuji catches up with Ayumi and expresses his seriousness. He suggests leaving the city together, as it only brings back bad memories. He said he will be waiting for her at the train station the next morning. However, Ayumi never shows up. The love journey of the Onibaku do is indeed a sad one. Soon after, Eikichi comes to pick Ryuji at the station to comfort him. They share the same fat which was being rejected by the ones they love. Eikichi then said that being rejected in love hurts more than being beaten by an enemy. The next day, Mariko came to the rooftop where the Onibako gang had gathered. She delivered a message from Ayumi that she's leaving the school and gave a letter to Ryuji. Soon after, Ryuji quickly read it. On the letter, Ayumi apologized and said she couldn't be with Ryuji. She realized she couldn't let go of her past and decided to continue her work as a teacher in another city. She didn't want to be a burden or hold back Ryuji's happiness with his friends. Then, Ayumi admitted she had truly liked him. On the other hand, Kamada, who had recovered, 
asked Akichi to talk privately. He revealed the secret behind why Kaoru couldn't accept Akichi's love. It turns out that Kaoru is actually a guy. After hearing that, Akichi went to Kaoru's school. It seemed like Akichi had more bad luck in his love stories. The person he had a crush on turned out to be a guy. At that time, Kaoru apologized and said he wouldn't forget Akichi, but he felt he didn't deserve him. He believed that someday he would find a girl who was a better match for him. Sometime later, it's a brand new school year and fresh faces join the student body. Akichi and Ryuji are excited to continue their school life and maybe find new love interests as they become seniors. However, to their surprise, Ryuji, Akichi, Saejima, and Kamada end up being placed in a different class due to the troubles they had last semester. They become the target of ridicule from other students, especially Akichi, who refuses to accept the idea of leaving their old class. But Makoto tries to cheer him up by saying that leaving the class isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it might give them a chance to meet new, cuter girls. It could be an opportunity for a fresh love story. The four friends can't help but imagine the beauty of the incoming students. They start to think about the potential crushes, and the only one that comes to mind is Ito. With anticipation, they step into their new class. Soon after, Ryuji, Eikichi, Saejima, and Kamada enter the classroom, trying to look more studious and wearing glasses to shed their tough guy image. But their excitement quickly turns to shock. Their hopes of encountering cute girls vanish because the class is filled with misbehaving students. It's a special class for troublemakers with low grades. The reality is far from what they'd expected, and they find themselves surrounded by delinquents. Suddenly, two students approach them with an air of confidence, just like how Makoto and Sukai used to act. Surprisingly, almost all the students in the class looked up to them and respected them. They saluted the Onibaku duo. This wasn't the situation they had anticipated. They didn't want to be involved in thuggish behavior anymore and tried to distance themselves from it. However, their attempts were interrupted by a girl who scolded them for blocking the entrance. At that moment, Akichi was instantly smitten with her. She had a sweet demeanor and even asked to meet him. But little did they know, this girl gave Akichi a swift kick and everyone burst into laughter. To make matters worse, a group of students entered claiming to be from the KT gang who aimed to dominate the school. They made it clear that the students who left the class had no right to boast in their presence. Their leader, Katsuyuki, was determined to teach a lesson to the seniors who abandoned their old class. At that time, Saejima struggled to keep his composure. Just then, Mariko entered the classroom and intervened, putting a stop to the brewing conflict. During recess, they felt awkward trying to fit in. They had hoped for a peaceful school life and a high school romance, but instead, they found themselves back in a class filled with troublemakers and delinquent students. Suddenly, a group of tough-looking girls gathered around Fujisaki Shinami, the girl who had kicked Akichi earlier. It seemed like these students held a grudge against her and wanted to intimidate her. Ryuji recalled hearing the name Fujisaki Shinami before. They scrutinized Shinami, searching for any weaknesses, but Shinami showed no signs of fear. On the other hand, Ido, who was peeking, witnessed the girl's impressive skills. Then, a new student arrived and was immediately targeted by his seniors. However, he effortlessly defeated the three bullies. This student turned out to be Sumoto Katsuyuki, the leader of the KT gang. He challenged Saejima and Kamada, who were hanging out on the school rooftop with one of their friends. Then, Katsuyuki declared that he would beat up the senior students who didn't move up a grade. He wanted to become the ruler of Sujido High School to honor and protect his respected seniors. At that moment, Abba tried to fight back, but he was swiftly knocked down by a powerful kick. Seeing that, Sanijima and Kamada laughed at Abba's defeat at the hands of a first-year student. Then, Katsuyuki shouted that he had joined Sujido High School for the sake of his admired seniors and that he would establish his rule to protect them. Soon after, Kamada and Saejima stepped forward to confront Katsuyuki, but he proved to be too quick for them to handle. And then out of nowhere, the Onibaku-do appeared on the roof. 
Katsuyuki, being the polite guy he is, quickly gave a fancy salute and bowed his head. Eikichi, being the cool dude he is, recognized him right away and couldn't believe that his younger buddies used to go to the same high school as him. Then Ryuji, who's just as awesome, introduced the mad dog do to Katsuyuki. And guess what? Katsuyuki was totally blown away to find out that Onibaku and the two mad dogs were actually friends. He wasted no time in saying sorry to Kamada, Saijima, and Abi for his earlier rude behavior. But here's the crazy part. The mad dog do had no idea that the seniors they were dealing with were none other than Eikichi and Ryuji. Turns out, Katsuyuki had already told his gang to teach those people on the roof a lesson, and boy, was he shocked when he found out what his men had done. Suddenly, the poor Katsuyuki started stuttering, desperately explaining that they had just messed with the legendary Onibaku and the badass mad dog Kamakura, whom he looked up to so much. Well, needless to say, the four of them were furious and absolutely not cool with what Katsuyuki's gang had done. They let out their anger like a volcano ready to explode. Meanwhile, there was Shinami, waiting for Eikichi in front of the class, all curious why he didn't remember her. But then, out of the blue, Ryuji jumped in and spilled the beans that Shinami was actually his neighbor from way back when. Can you believe it? This nerdy-looking girl was pretending to be a tough thug, but underneath all that, she was actually drop-dead gorgeous. Eikichi couldn't help but burst out laughing because he never saw that coming. But just when he thought things were cool, Shinami suddenly came back and gave him a swift kick. And then Ido caught up with Shinami and couldn't help but ask if she had some special feelings for Aikichi. But before Shinami could even respond, a fancy car pulled up next to them, snatching her away and forcing her into the car. Turns out this gang of wild girls was actually a local crew known as the Shonan Princess. On the other hand, there's this girl named Atsuko, who's had it out for Shinami for, like, forever. She purposely goes looking for trouble with her, and even gets her gang to beat her up. But guess what? They all got their butts handed to them. Now Atsuko is left to face the music all by herself. And yep, you guessed it, she gets defeated too. But then out of nowhere, this fancy car pulls up and this lady, Miki, steps out. Turns out she's the big boss of this girl gang called Miki's crew. She's super mad because her crew got humiliated by this cocky high school dude, and she starts scolding Atsuko for getting her butt kicked by Shinami. Next thing you know, Miki starts attacking Shinami and pulls out a razor blade, aiming to mess up her pretty face. But hold on tight because here come the Onibaku duo along with Ito. Shortly after, Eikichi steps up and tells them to knock it off because, hey, they're all girls and fighting just ain't cool. But Miki ain't having it, and she wants to take on the Onibaku duo. Yeah, like that's gonna happen. At that time, Eikichi even starts teasing this tough girl boss. Well, you can imagine how that turns out. Miki realizes she's no match for them. So, she calls someone from her car, and out comes this Yakuza dude, all scary and stuff, threatening the Onibaku do. Now, normally, these guys don't want to mess with the Yakuza, but Eikichi and Ryuji decide to swallow their pride and apologize to the Yakuza. This dude wants to take Shinami to their office to teach her a lesson, but she ain't having any of it. And boy, does that Yakuza get mad. He slaps Shinami, and that's when Eikichi loses it. He can't stand seeing someone hit a girl, so he tells the Yakuza to back off. Well, you can bet the Yakuza got even angrier. He thought he could mess with these two young dudes. Ha. But before he can do anything stupid, Eikichi and Ryuji kick him to the ground. Take that, Mr. Yakuza tough guy. And guess what? Shinami is totally amazed by Eikichi. He's just as cool as ever, doing his thing. But you know what? Eikichi can't stand people who abuse their power. And get this, the leader of those girl thugs, Miki, is also super into Eikichi. She's all starry-eyed and asks him to be her boyfriend. But let me tell you, even though Eikichi is single and ready to mingle, he ain't interested in dating a thug girl. So, what does he do? He bolts. Yup, he runs away as fast as he can. Now, Eikichi and Ryuji decide to take a break and go on a beach vacation. And you know what they start complaining about? They're tired of being thugs. Why? 
because they're convinced they won't be able to attract good-looking and amazing women if they keep up with the fuck life. But suddenly, a maid approaches them, and she's got a face that can make anyone go, wow. Her name is Nagisa, and she's drop-dead gorgeous. Ryuji is instantly smitten by her, and totally forgets about Ayumi. They start chatting and hitting it off, and let me tell you, Eikichi gets a little bit jealous. Soon after, Ryuji is totally caught up in his conversation with this maid girl. So, when Eikichi finishes his meal, he decides to make a move and give Ryuji a special gift. It's a magic rubber. Yeah, you heard that right. Then, Eikichi hands it to Ryuji, and he quickly hides it away, leaving Nagisa looking all confused. Thankfully, Nagisa is an innocent girl, so she has no idea what that thing is. Then, out of nowhere, another customer calls Nagisa over. But surprise, surprise. These two customers turn out to be total troublemakers, teasing poor Nagisa. And then, out of the blue, Nagisa lets out a big scream. At that moment, Ryuji gets startled and jumps back in surprise. But wait, what's happening? Those two troublemakers who were bothering Nagisa end up lying on the grass, knocked out. And get this, their motorcycle has a logo that Ryuji recognizes. It's from the infamous gang called Midnight Angel. They used to be a big deal, but they disbanded a while ago. Turns out, Nagisa isn't as innocent as she seems. She's got some tricks up her sleeve. Then, Ryuji tries to call out to her. But before he can do anything, Nagisa hops on her motorbike and zooms away. Back in the classroom, things are pretty messed up. Lots of students are skipping class, and their teacher, Kenji, is sound asleep. At that time, Saejima can't stand the situation and decides to wake up Kenji. Well, you can imagine how shocked the teacher was. He tells them to read on their own and just leaves the class. On the other hand, turns out, Ryuji hasn't been coming to class for a whole week, and everyone is surprised. Eikichi thinks maybe Ryuji is busy with some workshop stuff. They're all getting close to 17 years old now, so it's time to start thinking about the future. At that time, Eikichi, in his envy, wishes he was as busy as Ryuji in the workshop. He's got his post-graduation plans all figured out and feeling confident, he asks Shinami out. But hold your horses. As soon as Shinami realizes Eikichi is joking, she immediately smacks him. Ouch, that girl looks pretty annoyed, to say the least. Meanwhile, turns out, Ryuji has been helping out at his senior's workshop, Masami. And you know what? Ryuji decides to ask Masami about something called the Midnight Angel Motor Club. Turns out, Masami used to be one of the leaders of that club back in the day. But when Ryuji saw the club's logo recently, Masami denied any connection to it. He said the club had disbanded ages ago. Well, however, that doesn't stop Ryuji's curiosity. He waits for Nagisa at her workplace, and when she finally shows up, he bombards her with questions. At that time, Ryuji just can't hold back anymore, and he demands answers about this Midnight Angel thing. He pushes and pushes, and suddenly, Nagisa bursts into tears. Poor girl has no clue what Ryuji is talking about. She explains that the motorcycle he saw actually belonged to some thugs the other day. She just happened to find it, took it for a spin, and then left it on the street. Then, Ryuji quickly realizes he was mistaken and apologizes to Nagisa. To make it up to her, he treats her to some delicious ice cream. But here's the twist. Turns out the Midnight Angel gang is actually making a comeback. They're starting to send messages to other gangs around Shonan. And get this, they're planning to take control of the whole area, leaving no room for other gangs. And you know who's the unexpected leader of the revived gang? None other than Nagisa herself. She's been secretly beating up the leader of the rival gang. Soon after, Detective Yuda and his crew show up at the scene and start taking care of the injured gang members. But hold on, here comes someone from the criminal division. His name is Inatsu, and he starts questioning one of the motorcycle gang members, asking who did this. And you won't believe it, this young dude confesses that it was the Midnight Angel gang who did the damage. But guess what? Inatsu ain't buying it. He thinks the Midnight Angel gang is long gone and doesn't exist anymore. Well, Yuda steps in and stops Inatsu from giving the guy a beating. He asks Inatsu to just stay out of it. Turns out, these two divisions, 
Detective Yuda's team and the criminal division haven't been getting along for quite some time. But hey, looks like Inatsu is gonna get involved in this mess anyway. Now, let's switch gears to Makoto and Tsukai, who burst into the Onibaku classroom. Shonan is going crazy because the Midnight Angel motorcycle gang has reappeared. This gang was a big deal about five years ago, with almost 1,000 members. Whenever they showed up, the police had a real tough time dealing with them. And now, with the gang's second-generation leaders, Kamishi Matushiki and Akutsu Jr., things have gotten even messier. The Midnight Angels are in total chaos, fighting among themselves. Meanwhile, the police, led by Commander Inatsu, are out there hunting down every Midnight Angel member. But guess what? There's an unexpected power coming into play. It's the Onibaku Du suddenly showing up to take down those two leaders. And let me tell you, it's gonna make things a lot easier for the police to take them down too. On the other hand, when Katsuyuki and his buddies are heading home from school, they get confronted by another gang who wants to pick a fight. You know what? Nobody's gonna back down from a challenge. They're ready to throw down. But hold up, out of nowhere, this guy named Kamishima shows up. And guess what? Shinami recognizes him. She stops Katsuyuki from getting involved with this dude. Turns out, Shinami knows that Kamishima used to be the leader of the second generation of the Midnight Angels. She knows there's no way she can beat him. However, Kamishima got defeated by Onibaku before, and now they're back in action. But here's the thing, Katsuyuki ain't scared. He's all fearless. Back when he got beat up by Onibaku, he wasn't able to do anything but now he's determined to take Kamishima down. Kamishima even dares him to stand on the railroad tracks, but Katsuyuki ain't having it. He's too smart for that and heads upstairs instead. Oh, and get this, Kamishima used to have a thing for Shinami. If it weren't for Eikichi, he'd totally be after her. Phew, lucky Eikichi. The next day, Ryuji decides to visit Nagisa at her house, but boy, does he look tired. Maybe it's time for him to bust out that magic rubber of his. But wait. Nagisa's parents come home, and they greet Ryuji. It's the first time their daughter has brought friend over, so they want to have a serious talk. They share something important with Ryuji. Turns out, when they first moved into this house, Nagisa was still in school, and she became friends with a guy who rode a motorcycle. Every time Nag came home, he was all covered in blood and his personality changed a lot. But then, after that guy's buddy got arrested, Nagisa started staying at home all the time. It seems like Nagisa has two different sides to her. One that's always angry, and the other that's a good, obedient child. Well, however, Nagisa is furious because her parents spill her secret, and she lets out a big scream. Ryuji quickly dashes outside to see what's going on. And what does he find in the motorbike garage? It's a motorcycle with the Midnight Angel logo on it. This is the same bike from yesterday that Nagisa lied about. Oh boy, things just got even more complicated. Soon after, Nagisa shows up, but then something strange happens. Suddenly, two different personalities emerge from her. She ends up hitting Ryuji, and boy, does he feel the pain. She tells Ryuji to stay away because she doesn't know what's happening to her. Turns out there's another personality inside her. And get this, she shouts at Ryuji to leave, and then the angry personality takes over again, attacking Ryuji once more. When her parents try to intervene, she even attacks them. This feisty girl claims her name is Yasha, and she insists that Nagisa is just a weak girl. She claims to be the queen of motorbikes and the girlfriend of Akutsu Jr., the leader of the second generation of Midnight Angels. Then, Ryuji decides to leave the place, but as he walks away, he remembers something. The leader of the first generation of Midnight Angels was Masaki, a senior he really respected. Masaki disbanded his gang because he chose the wrong successor. And in the past, it was the two Onibaku guys who were assigned by Masaki to take down the Midnight Angels and defeat their two leaders. That's what connects Ryuji and Eikichi, because they used to be enemies. At that time, Ryuji recalls all those memories, and now the wild motorcycle gang is back in action. The next day, Commander Inatsu pays a visit to the principal's office, 
Meanwhile, in the classroom, Kenji just finished his lesson when suddenly, the principal walks in. And guess what? He's there to expel Katsuyuki for causing trouble at the station. Well, Eikichi ain't having any of that. He protests, saying it's not fair. But right at that moment, Commander Inatsu enters the scene. And here's the deal. Starting today, their divisions are gonna team up to get rid of all the naughty kids. And poor Katsuyuki gets expelled. The school in Sujido doesn't want any troublemakers anymore. They won't tolerate anyone who joins a motorcycle club. But hold on a second. Kenji doesn't accept this decision. He's so fired up that he actually hits the principal. He's ready to fight anyone who treats his students like trash. However, oh boy, the principal is furious. He's all fired up and wants to fire Kenji. But before he storms out, Kenji gives some advice to his students to just be yourselves. And guess what? Eikichi chases after Kenji and tells him that he knows what he's gonna do next. He's gonna become a teacher, just like Kenji. How cool is that? Soon after, Ryuji enters the school to meet up with Eikichi. He reminds his friend about the promise they made way back when. You know, the one where they'll fight to prove who's the strongest. But hey, before they do that, they've got a mission to fulfill. They need to protect the city of Shonan, just like they promised their senior, Masaki. And wouldn't you know it, the Midnight Angel motorcycle gang is back in action. There's this guy named Akutsu Junya, and he just got out of prison. And Nagisa, who's been taken over by her Yasha personality, is waiting outside. Meanwhile, in a repair shop, the phone keeps ringing like crazy. And who's the owner? It's Akira, the former leader of the first generation Midnight Angels. He gets a call from Masami, who warns him about the second generation leader, Akutsu. He says Akutsu is out and about, so Akira better watch out. But you know what? It's too late. Akutsu has already arrived. Turns out, this guy is searching for something, which was the motorbike and robe left by the Midnight Angel's founder, Masaki. At that time, Akutsu believes that with those two items, he can bring back all the Midnight Angel members who left and gain absolute power. But alas, he doesn't find what he's looking for, so he decides to go ahead and try to kill Akira. Meanwhile, Ryuji and Eikichi are just chilling at a regular cafe. But guess what? Their other friends are all busy discussing how the Midnight Angel gang is causing chaos, and their leader Akutsu is desperately searching for some legendary cloaks and motorcycles that prove the greatness of the Midnight Angels. And then, out of the blue, Shiami shows up looking for Ryuji. She informs them that Nagisa is on the lookout for them. Shinami manages to calm down the angry Eikichi too. Shortly after, Ryuji explains that Nagisa has those two different personalities because of Akutsu. This poor girl has quite a sad fate. All she wants is to have a private talk with Ryuji. Then with their friends watching, Ryuji heads to the beach to have a conversation with Nagisa. Little do they know, this cute girl is actually Yasha, the fierce leader of the second generation of Midnight Angels. Turns out, Nagisa's past is just so gloomy. She meets Akutsu, thinking he's a nice guy. But then, she gets forced to do some awful things, which was torturing members of a rival motorcycle gang, and even beating up guys with a baseball bat. At that time, Eikichi is still uncertain about Nagisa. He knows that girl needs to be watched closely, because it could be really dangerous if she transforms into Yasha. It's a tough situation for sure. But you know what? Nagisa pours her heart out to Ryuji. She's feeling so lonely and going through so much pain. And you know what Ryuji does? He promises her one thing that he'll always be there for her and protect her. How sweet is that? Now here comes Shinami, chatting with Eikichi. She's all like, wow, Ryuji is so lucky to have such a great girl. But secretly, Shinami has always had a thing for Aikichi. Poor guy, he's just so slow to realize it. Ido jumps in and calls him stupid for not understanding women. The next day, Ryuji takes Nagisa to his secret spot. It was a place where she goes when she's feeling down. It's this old wrecked bus that Nagisa really likes for some reason. She'd do anything to be with Ryuji. Then, they hop into the bus, and Ryuji asks her to stay there for a while until they can deal with the whole Midnight Angel mess. Those motorcycle gang dudes are causing chaos everywhere, 
and more and more of their old members are showing up. The media even reports on it. They even interview Akutsu, who claims he's looking for his girl Yasha. And you know what? Akutsu's rival, Kamishima, sees that broadcast and he gets even angrier. He thinks he should be the one ruling over the Midnight Angel gang, not Akutsu. Kamishima's face got messed up because of Akutsu's actions. And then, Kamishima kidnaps Shinami and says that once he's done dealing with Akutsu and the Midnight Angel gang, he's gonna destroy the Onibaku too. Anyway, back to our young couple. They start living in that wrecked bus. At that time, Nagisa cooks something for Ryuji. And suddenly, they hear the TV broadcast from last night that Akutsu talking about how he's searching for Yasha. Well, Nagisa overhears that, and her other personality takes over. She attacks poor Ryuji. And wouldn't you know it? Akutsu and his gang show up to take Nagisa away. Man, this girl has really changed. Then, Ryuji shouts, trying to make them realize what's happening. Akutsu even gives Nagisa something and tells her to hurt Ryuji. At that moment, everything is so confusing. It's giving him a massive headache. He just doesn't know which personality to trust. Fortunately, Nagisa's other personality refuses to do any harm to Ryuji. She's struggling to keep it under control, and it's driving her crazy to live with two personalities. Feeling so hopeless, Ryuji stops her from using the knife on herself. It's such a sad moment for Nagisa. And wouldn't you know it? Akutsu is furious and wants to kill Ryuji, but Nagisa stops him. This poor girl is hurting too. She says she won't let her pass to defeat her. Ryuji is the only one who believes in her in this world, but sadly, she's unconscious. At that moment, Akutsu laughs all happily, thinking he'll finish them off. He even plans to douse Ryuji with patrol and set him on fire. That's just downright mean. But hey, guess what? The two young ones are rushed to the emergency room right away. Ryuji begs the doctor to put them in the same room. Meanwhile, Inatsu receives a report from his men. It turns out Ryuji from the Onibaku duo has been beaten and is now in the hospital. At that time, Inatsu actually planned to let the thugs fight each other and wipe themselves out. Only then would he make a move and take them all down. On the other side, the Setsuri gang led by Kamishima is on the move. They're gonna attack the Midnight Angels. Inatsu laughs all wickedly because this is exactly what he wanted to happen. And over at the Midnight Angel headquarters, the two groups come face to face. Kamishima says he's been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. He won't forgive them for the wounds they caused. And you know what? The two gangs start fighting, side by side. Oh no, Shinami is stuck in the middle of this wild battle. It's chaos, chaos everywhere. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Nagisa and Ryuji are getting the care they need. And guess who shows up? It's Aikichi. He's determined to sort things out and make sure they can be together without any more interruptions. Soon after, Ryuji apologizes to Aikichi because he couldn't fight alongside him. But you know what? Aikichi tells him to stay right there and protect Nagisa. And here's the twist. Turns out, the cloak and motorbike that Akutsu was desperately searching for. Well, they were actually with Aikichi all along. In the past, before retiring, Masaki had given those two items to Aikichi. It's like destiny chose him to put an end to the gang war in Shauna. On the other hand, back at the Midnight Angel's hideout, the battle is going crazy. Akutsu managed to defeat Kamishima, leaving only himself standing. All of his gang members have been taken down. And you know what? Shiami, who's totally clueless about everything, is caught up in the mess too. However, Kamishima is so stubborn, he'd rather die than be defeated by anyone, especially Akutsu. But wait, Akutsu looks at Shinami and thinks she's the perfect replacement for Yasha. He shouts out that Kamishima's whole gang is now a part of the Midnight Angel gang. They're gonna wipe out all the other gangs in Shonan and bow down to Akutsu's rule. He really thinks they're the only ones who can exist. And just when things seem hopeless, guess who shows up? It's Aikichi with the legendary cape and motorcycle that used to belong to the old Midnight Angel leader. There, Aikichi calls out Akutsu, saying he's just a funny legend who can never become someone like Misaki. 
Hearing that really ticks off Akutsu, and he launches an attack on Eikichi. But let me tell you, dealing with Eikichi is like dealing with a superhero. Akutsu is no match for his powerful punches. It's like, boom. Pow. Take that, Akutsu. At that time, everyone in the gang went dead silent. Eikichi had proven himself to be just as strong as their old leader. One of the gang members even poured gasoline on Eikichi, trying to set him on fire. But guess what? Eikichi didn't let that stop him. He just kept on going, fearless and unstoppable. All the gang members were terrified by the sheer power of the Onibaku. And with one final punch, this guy couldn't fight back anymore. Eikichi spoke up and said, Masaki is gone, and this is not what he wanted. The Midnight Angel gang must disband. Hearing that, Akutsu could only cry as he watched his dream cape get destroyed. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Nagisa starts to realize that her Yasha personality is taking over. She rebels and fights against it. The doctor, Ryuji, and the nurses have to hold her down. It's quite a shocking scene. Suddenly, Nagisa's heartbeat and pulse stop. It's like she's gone, just like that. But then, out of nowhere, she comes back to consciousness. Her pulse starts beating again. Finally, this girl has managed to conquer the worst part of herself. Phew, what a roller coaster. On the other hand, back at the Midnight Angel base, things got pretty crazy. Inatsu and his whole squad showed up, ready to take down everyone there. They started beating up all the gang members, including poor Eikichi. However, Shinami couldn't stand it and screamed for them to stop. But then, out of nowhere, their friends from Sujito High School arrived. They came to rescue Eikichi and fought against the officers. At that time, Shinami was about to get hit, but guess what? Eikichi swooped in and saved her just in time. And in that moment, he finally confessed his feelings to her. He might not be great with words, but she means everything to him. After all the chaos, Detective Yuda and his crew showed up. There he told Inatsu not to abuse his power and reminded him that young people can change. Soon after, Mariko apologized and asked for forgiveness for her students. And you know what? Yuda actually praised her, saying she's a good teacher. So this time, he let them off the hook. At that time, Saejima was really impressed with Yuda's character. He wants to be a cop just like him one day. And finally, all the problems in Shonan were resolved. The next day on the beach, the two Onibaku make a promise to determine who's the strongest. Eikichi says that one day he'll become a teacher. Ryuji declares that he'll open his own workshop and propose to Nagisa. And with that, the Onibaku officially disband. Can you believe they used to fight each other on this very beach every single day? It was actually Masaki who suggested that they team up instead of fighting all the time. And now, they've come a long way. What a journey. Then after school, it was time for Eikichi and Ryuji to have their epic duel to decide who's the strongest. They gave it their all, but guess what? They turned out to be equally strong. Can you believe it? It was a sunny spring day at the beach, and the girls were playing volleyball. The ball accidentally landed in Saijima's hands, and in his grogginess, he tossed it back, scaring the girls and making everyone burst into laughter. Soon after, Tsukai saved the day and stopped the commotion. Finally, Ryuji and Nagisa reunited, and he promised to always be there for her. They even shared a kiss, which made Nagisa feel a little embarrassed since their friends saw it all. Oh boy, sadly, Eikichi wasn't too happy about it. He got all worked up, wondering why Ryuji was casually kissing his girlfriend. But Saejima teased him back, saying he's been dating Shinami for months and still hasn't mustered the courage to kiss her. Ouch. Suddenly, Makoto stepped in to break up their argument and suggested they all take a group photo. And that's a wrap, folks. The series about the exciting adventures of youth, chasing dreams and love, comes to an end. It's been quite the journey. The series ends. The moral lesson from this series is if you're going to have a beach duel, make sure you bring sunscreen and don't forget to share the snacks afterward.